to me, this suggests that you know, the U.S. could make some changes and reduce its emissions by a factor of two and a half to get down to the European values, say, and maybe Texas can get down to California values with certain relatively modest changes that would not hurt the economy, in fact. Uh, the natural greenhouse effect, this is uh, our estimates of it uh, as a whole. Water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas, about 60%. Carbon dioxide is around a quarter. Ozone around 8%. And methane and nitrous oxide make up most of the rest. There are some trace gases also that contribute a little bit more and they're growing in time. And clouds also play a role. Water vapor, however, has an average lifetime in the atmosphere of about nine days. And of course, we're very familiar with that, the, the water, the hydrological cycle, so to speak. We get evaporation, we get rain, and then the water vapor comes out. And so if we put more water into the atmosphere by irrigation, by using a hose or something or the other, it doesn't last very long. And so that's not the important aspect of what's going on. It's these long-lived greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide also has a lifetime of over 100 years. Methane's more like 10 years. So it's not quite such a problem in that regard. Ozone uh, varies very rapidly in the, in the troposphere. So it's, it's uh, not as much concern. It does contribute, however. And depletion of ozone in the stratosphere is, is uh, also playing a role, but that's a slightly different problem. Schematically, what these greenhouse gases do is you have the sun's radiation coming in. O normal oxygen and nitrogen uh, is, is, um, doesn't affect the incoming radiation. There's a certain amount that gets reflected from clouds. There's a certain amount that gets reflected from the ground. Most of it gets absorbed at the ground. There's a little bit that gets absorbed in the atmosphere because of things like water vapor. And then the atmosphere has to radiate back to space in order to maintain an equilibrium climate. Some of that radiation gets trapped by these greenhouse gases and then re-emitted both up and down. And it provides therefore a blanket, especially this downward radiation that provides an extra warming of the planet. In fact, it's what makes the planet habitable. Without the greenhouse effect, the planet would not be habitable. The temperature would be very much colder than it is now. Well, as scientists, we like to put numbers on these kinds of things, and Jeff Keel and I did this uh, with the, um, I guess, most definitive values that exist at the moment back in 1997. You might remember some numbers. This is the number that's coming in, 342 watts per meter squared. This is for every meter squared on the planet Earth, day and night, uh, summer and winter, the average number, and 342 watts. Um, so th remember that number, about 30% gets reflected um, here, some of it gets absorbed directly, and 168 gets absorbed at the surface. Now going out at the top by construction when we did this, this is actually the difference between these, and so this corresponds to an equilibrium uh, climate. In actual fact, the difference between these, uh, the, the net amount absorbed and that going out, the best estimate is around 0.8 watts per meter squared. That's what the change in the composition of the atmosphere is actually doing for us. It's a fairly small number, but it's still, um, overall, it turns out to be around 1% of the net flow of energy through the system. And so the amount that's going through the system is more down the bottom here, and this number is probably a little bit high, but we have a lot of radiation at the surface, so on clear, cool nights, uh, especially when there's not much water vapor in the atmosphere, it'll cool off and radiation will go out to space. But if there's a lot of clouds or if there's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, you get a lot of back radiation and the net radiation losses end up being about 66 of these units. And the bigger cooling at the surface actually comes from what is labeled here evapotranspiration. Evaporation and the transpiration through plants. So that's the process that, that takes place in association with photosynthesis um, and, and water vapor comes out of the stomata in the leaves of the plants and, and uh, goes into the atmosphere. And so plants sort of act like a pump. Or they, they pump sort of water vapor out of, or water out of the ground and into the atmosphere through this transpiration process. And so evaporative cooling turns out to be more important 
than radiative cooling and also direct um, temperature related um, thermal cooling of the surface. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Now this is where this number comes in again. What happens if we convert that into actual energy? Well, it turns out it corresponds to 175 petawatts. A petawatt is 10 to the 15 watts. That means a one with 15 zeros after it. Those of you who are into computers will know uh, what a, a, a mega something is, and then you go up to giga, and then you go up to tera, and then you go up to peta. So this is 15 zeros after it. So it also can be expressed as 175 billion billion watts, if you like. And the net amount that's absorbed, so 30% gets reflected, about 120 petawatts is absorbed. There's a tremendous amount of energy flowing in, flowing through the climate system from the sun. The biggest power plants we have in existence today are somewhere between 1 and 2,000 megawatts. And normally we think in terms of you know, light bulbs, a 100 watt light bulb, uh, or maybe a kilowatt, which is a sort of a one bar uh, power heater, uh, electrical heater that you might use. Uh, if you plug your iron in, it's um, using something like a uh, kilowatt of, of electricity or something like that. So the biggest power plants are of, of this order of magnitude. And so the energy from the sun then is 120 million of these power stations. Now it turns out you can add up all of the power stations around the world and you can also add up all of the energy that's consumed by, because we know how much oil is sold and coal is sold and presumably burned. And if you do that sum, it turns out to be one nine thousandth of this value. So if you add up all of these power plants, it's one nine thousandth. And so the direct human influence which is related to energy compared with the sun are quite small. Now that's on a global basis of course and a lot of the energy we use is not occurring out over the middle of the Pacific or in Antarctica. Instead it's focused in cities and in cities it can be comparable to or as large as the sun and so that gives rise to what is called the urban heat island effect. And so there are local environments around cities which are changed by the change in vegetation and concrete and uh, the direct, direct generation of heat from space heating and so on. But the main way human activities can affect the global climate is by changing this natural flow of energy through the system by changing the greenhouse effect. And as I mentioned before, that effect is about a 1% effect whereas the direct generation of energy is about one nine thousandth or, or about one percent of the greenhouse effect, in other words, or one ninetieth of that. Global warming is unequivocal. This was the statement from the IPCC. I mean, this is a remarkable statement. It was passed by a, something like 109 governments and the evidence is so strong that we were able to get that uh, agreement, unanimous agreement on, on a word like that in the IPCC report. And this is the evidence. I'm going to go through uh, some, but not quite all of the evidence uh, pointing to that. So global surface temperatures we'll talk about. I won't talk about the temperatures above the surface. Uh, John Christie might talk about that kind of thing more. Um, and he's been involved in controversy related to that because there's different versions of the truth there. Uh, global sea surface temperatures I'll talk a little bit about and ocean temperatures in general. I won't say too much about those except in conjunction with global sea level. Water vapor is increasing. Rainfall intensity is increasing. Precipitation is changing in its patterns. Hurricanes are increasing in intensity. Uh, drought is generally increasing. And uh, heat waves and, and extreme temperatures. And on the cold side, there are generally decreases. So let's look at some of this evidence. <coughs> 